Hello and welcome to The Pain and Pleasure of Living a Life on Purpose. Now today I'm joined by two completely gorgeous people who really can say um, that they have been through one hell of a lot of pain. I'm joined by Aidy and Kate from across the ditch in Australia. Now I made the connection with them through the um, being co-authors uh, within the Inspiration Bible and that was ooh, uh, two, three years ago now. Thereabouts. Yes. Thereabouts. Thereabouts. Aidy, I'm, I am, have not attempted to um, say your surname. Can you share it with us? <laughs> okay. Okay. Jaya. Jaya. Mihaja. Mihaja. Did Jaya I say Mihaja. that? Right? Jaya, Jaya Mihaja. Mihaja. Yeah, she lets me have all the rest of the day, okay? <laughs> <laughs> all right, then. <laughs> now, um, um, Aidy uh, has an amazing story, and between him and Kate, they put this together in what they call a little book of hope. Now, maybe I can just hand it over to you, Aidy, to um, tell us a little bit about what has happened to you 10 years ago, how it started 10 years ago. Well, about 10 years ago, as I indicated before, it was a classic case of lifestyle karma in that I simply yielded what I had sown. Now, I uh, was, have worked for the last 30 years or so in, as a screen media professional at both national and international level. And with that comes a very intense lifestyle where, especially in Asia, um, 20 hour days and seven day working weeks were not uncommon. Wow. And I had fully convinced myself that KFC was a food group and that the best way to approach a balanced meal is to have a diet coke with pizza. So with that, in t on top of smoking up to four packets of cigarettes a day, it sort of lay the, um, the what I call the undeniable, inescapable consequence of cause and effect. Absolutely. So what happened? Well, I felt I had a series of debilitating headaches. I thought my head would explode, and guess what it did? Really? Yes. I, I suffered... I want to say I experienced two hemorrhage strokes. Wow. First in 2006, where I basically had to spend two weeks in hospital under observation, enduring some very serious average hospital food. <laughs> then again in mid 2011, I suffered another hemorrhage stroke where I had to have emergency life saving brain surgery under an induced coma. Wow. Which has affected, created, well, first of all, I wasn't expected to survive by the doctors. And it, uh, it, it, it left me with paralysis on my left side. I think that's what we call it, hemiplegic is the term they used. So the, the, the bleed on my brain was on the right side of my brain, which of course affects the opposite side of the body. Oh, okay. So how long was the recovery then? Oh, Kate, you can help me out. It was months. Well, Eddie was in hospital for seven months. Yes. Um, so the first three weeks he was in a coma. Yeah. And basically every day the doctors just kept saying, you know, you know he might die, you know he might die. And, and then um, when they moved him to the ward, about six weeks after um, they took out his uh, trache trachyoscomy, um, which is like a hole in the windpipe. Yeah. And um, they basically said, look, you know, he might never speak or, or talk again, talk or eat again. And um, so we were very, very relieved when AD was able to speak. Mind you, it was very difficult for him to speak because of the paralysis and everything else. And obviously, you know, what's happened to his brain and all the drugs that he was on and um, because of, you know, the heavy medication in the hospital, etc. Um, and it's actually quite funny <laughs> what happened because um, his dad was in there as well and uh, his dad started questioning him. What was the first question your dad said to you, darling? Very much, but three weeks in a coma, I'm bringing a question over, and he said, who were the, the journalist who uncovered the Watergate scandal? Who was the second journalist? And I thought, why would he want to talk about Woodward and Bernstein now? <laughs> I think, you know, probably 80's dad was, you know, in shock and everything as well. But the doctors were so amused. I think they were thinking, you know. But well, anyway, you 80 answered the question. So, you know, they so, like, okay, he's, he's, he's okay, you know. So, yes, I'm there in the process of walking and I walk 
700 meters a day. Yep. As a record, that's good. Though technically, I'm still just outside Olympic qualifying time. Okay. Just outside what? Olympic qualifying time. <laughs> You've got your wicked sense of humour seems to have got you through an awful lot of things. Yes, oh, it's saved my life. Um, one of the first thoughts I had about that was what I first said to the doctors, nurses, and all the therapists in the hospital was. To qualify and prepare you to do what you do, did you do the weekend TAFE course or the full full week course? And then uh, the and then the brain didn't say, no, actually, I did the online course. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Awesome. So when were you, after you came out of the coma, when were you, did you feel that you were aware of actually what had actually happened to you? Well, actually, um, so I'll take a quick sip of water here, but actually it was... It was during that time when I had this uh, voice say to me over and over again, like in a flashback in a film, that whatever we think, feel, say and do echoes in eternity because we we're all connected. And I was like a flashback, all connected, all connected. And, and the first thing I said to Kate was that, and then said, you know, I had this incredible urge to forgive and to spread the love, but in a non herpes kind of way, okay? Yeah, yeah. So I spread the love and just want to forgive because I had been through a lot of stress prior to my stroke. Mm-hmm. And, and you'd be quite angry. I had a lot of anger, but I knew that to hold on to resentment would be like to hold on to a burning hot piece of coal in that I'll be the only get hurt, you know? Yes, yes. So, so go and forgive. Yeah. yeah, and Eddie kept saying to me, he kept saying all the time, we're all connected. And I'm thinking, what happened to him? <laughs> Where have you been? Where have you been? Where have you been? Where have you been? <laughs> um, and, you know, and I was quite amazed because I was still angry about some of the things that had happened before he had the stroke. And... You know, I was just so amazed. It, 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 even when things went wrong in hospital, like silly mistakes that shouldn't have happened, um, that I thought, oh, I'm getting really annoyed about this, the way he's being treated or something like that. <laughs> and AD would just keep saying, you know, even when they went to go keep giving the wrong medication and all that kind of thing, he, he just kept saying to me, Kate, just be open-hearted, you know, just be loving and open-hearted. I thought, wow. <laughs> Love you open-hearted and call our lawyer. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, so both feet firmly on the ground. So how was it for you, Kate? Did you feel helpless in any way? Oh, at times I felt really, really helpless because when AD like, was in hospital for that seven months, the first few months when he was in the acute hospital, um, I actually decided to stay by his bedside um, because when he first moved into the ward, out of, in ICU, you've got 24-7 care. And then when he moved into the ward, the first night I went home late and then I rang at about three in the morning and I was just like worried about him because he was in a room on his own and, you know, no one was there to be with him all the time. You know, he couldn't call out. He couldn't press a nurse button. He, couldn't, he was just, you know, bed with rails, you know, stuck there, not being able to communicate. And he had this... Um, tracky in and tubes everywhere and the nurse said to me oh he's tried to pull the uh the tracky out of his windpipe uh it's bleeding a little bit but he should be okay and I just thought he should be okay okay well he nearly died you know they kept saying that well actually he's when he went into the I found later on when he went into the brain surgery and they actually cut out a big part of his skull which um, was replaced six months later, um, they actually had written down on the, on the report of the operation that they didn't expect him to gain consciousness. It was just for life-saving measures, yeah. the operation. Anyway, so I was just like, you know, I need to be there. I don't want him to pull, pull it out because that was the only part of his body that he was moving was his left arm, right arm, right arm sorry, he would try and pull this tube out. He kept trying to pull the tube out. Anyway, 
Um, and they said that we might have to uh, restrain him. And I thought, well, that's the last thing, you know, imagine, you know, being restrained as well. You can't communicate, being restrained. I thought that's just awful. So and I was in a, in a bed with these bed rails, so I felt like a, a caged hen fantasising about being free range. Yeah. So did you, Aidy, um, when you were there, did, I, did you feel as if people were talking over you and that you you wanted a voice even though that perhaps at that stage you couldn't voice your feelings i felt at times i felt a bit annoyed and hurt that i felt that they were, people were talking around me rather than talking to me yeah. i had lost my dignity identity, dignity and identity as an individual so that was a bit awkward to deal with mm. yeah. and they'd often come in the nurses and the doctors and they just talk about talk about him you know, without talking to him. Yeah. Um, and I think that's just what they do. And I think it's something that, you know, not everyone does it. And I think that it's something that will hopefully change in the culture of hospitals because I know there's some positive changes that are that are taking place. Um, but can I just go back to the story about when yes, AD right. was... That's all right. When, when AD was um, in the acute hospital. Um, so basically he would try and pull his, his trachea out so um, so I decided to stay there every night. So I actually sat in a chair next to Aidy and what I did is I taped our wrists together um, so that... So that kind of romantic. Kind of romantic. Um, so that if I fell asleep that and, and Aidy pulled, I would be woken and also I could calm him down too, you know, say, it's okay, honey, it's okay. Because um, I just think, I just can't imagine, you know, being in that situation he was in and I just thought if ever you need support and you know Aidy's such a loving kind person I just thought that's just where I needed that's where I needed to be and I was lucky I was in the position where I was well enough to be able to do that and that's why I always think I mean I always like I say to people in the book just because that's what I did that doesn't mean that's what you should do because everyone has their own situation you have to weigh things up you ask, you know, ask yourself, meditate, pray about it or whatever, what's the best thing to do? Sometimes families can take it in t turns and shifts. Um, but in our situation, I just felt that was what I needed to do. And I, I, I promise you, so many nights I only had half an hour, an hour sleep in a chair. <laughs> um, but I managed. And I think, you know, because I was, I was well, you know, I was able to manage that for a short, you know, period of time. And, um, yeah, and then when AD moved into the uh, re 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 rehab re hospital, that was probably ended up actually being the toughest time because they wouldn't let me stay the night. Right. And even though AD was starting to be able to mumble his words a bit and, you know, he could talk a little bit, he still wasn't able to press the nurse button. Um, even though it was his left side that was affected, his right side, he still couldn't work out how to press a button or make a phone call or do anything like that. So I just felt awful leaving him thinking, wow, if he needs help, he can't call for help, you know. And, um, you know, sometimes I'd come in in the morning. I'd, come, I'd leave as late as they would allow me to and I'd get there as early as they would allow me to. But often I'd come in and, you know, he, his bed would be wet and, you know, all that kind of thing. And it was just, you know, I mean, the nurses are run off their feet. They really are. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm not, I wasn't angry with them I was just, my concern was just for 80, you know. Yeah. Um, and, I, and you asked me the question when I started talking and waffling on, going back to your original question, did I feel helpless? I felt really helpless when he was in the rehab hospital because, you know, I just so much wanted to be able to bring him home and look after him, but he wasn't, you know, in a situation where he could come home yet. He still hadn't had his skull bone put back in. Wow. Um, so, like, he had to wear, like, a helmet, you know. Um, and, and uh, yeah, it just was a, a difficult, really difficult situation. When he was in the rehab hospital, he was sharing a room with about, you know, five others. So it wasn't privacy. I, I missed my cuddles with him and, you know, all of that kind of thing. He looks very cuddleable. He's very cuddly. <laughs> Interestingly about the, the, the skull thing, um, because it looked like I'd been hit by a swinging golf club, had this big dent in my head. Right. And I said to the doctors, um, surgeons, where's my skull bone? And they said, it's in the deep freeze. And I was like, deep freeze? Said, what, next to the Cornettos? <laughs> anyway, so, yeah. 
So were you aware of the the time that was involved in all this, AD? You know, um, night and day and weeks of going into months or? Uh, roughly, roughly night and day in the, uh, in that, you know, I had, I had uh, routines with Kate, like she would always bring me um, um, freshly squeezed juices in the morning. And I'd say, after a while I said, tomorrow can you bring me a roast beef juice? <laughs> <laughs> and then she bought whole new things I'd never heard of, like activated walnuts, whatever the hell they are. <laughs> <laughs> All healthy stuff, not KLC yeah. then, obviously. Yeah, that's it. I know. And I used to bring him lots of blueberries because I knew they were good yeah. for the brain. And actually, yeah. the doctors were always really impressed. They were like, oh, wow, I wish we could have breakfast like that. <laughs> you know. Um, so. But the life change, lifestyle change has been, has been instrumental in that. You know, as I said, lifestyle has got me into the situation, but also lifestyle is getting me out of it and beyond it. That's key. That's key. I mean, like Kate mentioned meditation before. Yes. Meditation is a big part of our life. What, before or since? Since. Since. Right. Yeah. Meditate every, every morning. Would you like to say calm and centered, okay? <laughs> Like the common sense. That's it. So, Kate, did you come up with the idea to meditate together or was it something that you did um, since you've been home together? Well, kind of weird because it started a little bit in hospital because um, because AD had high blood pressure and that was a cause of his uh, blood vessel. There's two different types of stroke. There's a one that's a clot and there's a one that's a bleed. Most people who have a bleed die and AD had a bleed. Most people's strokes are clots. Um, so if you get to the hospital quickly, you can have the clot broken up and, you know, but 80s was a bleed and that's why they had to do the operation and, and remove the skull because of the swelling and everything like that. Um, sorry, can you ask me the question again? Sorry. Uh, the meditation, did, when did that start? Well, you start, oh, the meditation, I, I started yeah. meditation once doing my martial, hospital, arts, martial arts. Oh, the, you did a, when I was a teenager. Bit, yeah, when you were a teenager, but then but you stopped. I stopped, obviously. Yeah. So, but in hospital, I got in this machine called uh, Respirate, which is the which is a, something that um, our chiropractor, who's American, fantastic chiropractor, Dr. Ari Diskin. I don't know if you know him, but it's fantastic. Um, he recommended it, and I, so I had to get it in from America. Um, and it, it's kind of like a meditation. It's like a breathing to, to music. Yes. And it's actually shown to reduce blood pressure naturally. It's the only thing that's a FDA. I don't know if that really means anything. But anyway, approved. make the medical people happy. Approved. Yeah. Um, that's a non, non-drug. Yeah. Um, so he started doing that. And it was a little bit like that was kind of like the start of meditation. And then when AD got home, we went and did a transcendental meditation course together. What I really like about it, though, is that meditation is... They say uh, um, it really helps quiet in the mind, yeah. you know, and centre your consciousness. Yeah. And if you think of prayer as talking to God, yeah. think of meditation as listening. Oh, I've never That's heard that. Family, you know. yeah. yeah, I like that. Are you listening to God or listening to your connection to God or yourself? How would you describe it? A little from Combe, a little from Combe. Yeah. It's whatever it means to you, you know. Yes, yes. And, and the thing I like about it too is, you know, now we can actually prove that meditation does help in the healing process because of brain imaging techniques. You know, I, I know. mean, you know, a lot of people have known for a long, long time that meditation helps, but, you know, the scientific community haven't always, you know, totally agreed or supported it, but now it's actually proven They've, they've got brain imaging techniques that they can show someone before they meditate and after they meditate. And it's amazing, you know, and, and then they've done experiments with people um, having uh, with skin problems, you know, the meditators versus the non-meditators. And there's actually clear scientific clinical evidence that meditation actually helps in the healing process as well. So, you know, yes, it helps with anxiety and yes, it helps, you know, with many other things, but it does actually help with your immune system, you know, your blood pressure, all kinds of things. So I think that's really exciting yeah. too. So how long do you meditate for daily? Uh, around about 15 minutes. A few minutes about that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's like, like that's like, that's the, the definite meditation that we never compromise on. Yeah. But then there's other meditation that we will do you know, at times, like a couple of days ago, I went for a walk and then I just sat out there for, you know, 20 minutes and meditated on the rock. So, you know, 
that's that's a no excuse meditation every morning yeah. and then we can we we will on it we do that together and then there's you know other stuff that we will do and the great personal rewarding experience i found with meditation is that i have developed my own uh, mantra through meditation right. so what so what can you share that yeah sure in a piece in a piece in a freaking piece <laughs> I love you. <laughs> love you too, <laughs> So what, apart, what other um, things have helped you? Because your, your book called The Little Book of Help. Now you, Hope Even, sorry, The Little Book of Help. Now I love this yeah. because my family motto is hope, light and difficulty. So I can, re I really, really resonate with the title of your book. And I know you brought this out at the end of 2013. Yeah. It had a it was essence of it and you republished it um beginning of may so it's got your entire story can you tell us a bit more about um the hope that you put it and the reason for doing the book and what it what it's gonna the the great quality of hope in my in my humble opinion is that it gives us the courage to take on and overcome our greatest challenges right that's all about hope all about and hope we've, Yes, and it also it helps um, stimulate the qualities of uh, gratitude and appreciation. Right. So uh, having an attitude of gratitude and bookending a day is, I, is something I developed in hospital where I would focus, help, help me focus on the positives and reframe some things that weren't necessarily that positive at the time. So you that's... Know, re reframing, so that right? Came, so that came the, from the learning in the hospital as well. That's yeah. really... Um, that's yeah. very refreshing to hear. Yes. Because Aidy said, you know, when he was in lying in that bed and and when he, you know, couldn't get out, couldn't press the nurse button, he really realised, I mean, it'd be so easy to go crazy in that, you yeah, know, situation absolutely. when you've got pin, someone pinning and prodding you all the time. You know, he really realised then that the battle is won and lost in the mind. And, and that I was right, attitude is everything. Yeah, and that's when he started, okay, you know, even though he couldn't write it down, you know, he would think in his mind, okay, you know, as soon as he, he formed the habit, every morning straight away, what am I grateful for, what am I grateful for? And then he would do the same before he went to sleep. I'll book it each day yeah. with the top five, of, you know, of gratitude and also things that I feel I could would uh, would make me laugh or make you smile, you know. I can imagine, I can imagine, because, I mean, a sense of few, I mean, it's it really sees it through and it's really shining in your example here, but having gone through something really quite so extreme that, you know, you, I can see your eyes are twinkling and it, mm -hmm. <laughs> it just bounces off you that that sense of maintaining that sense of humor is so uh, sometimes you have to, it, it is more difficult than others to uh to deal with and and sometimes also that the 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 funny side of it you don't realize till later like there was some dark moments in the hospital for example when i was in my wheelchair and i was i was so um down by the thought of becoming a burden to kate that i was seriously thinking of um hurling myself with a wheelchair down the stairs until the nurse told me that we were on the ground floor. <laughs> and I was out outside. <laughs> one of the things that happened to AD is um, um, a lot of his vision has gone. That's why I keep trying to make him real, you know, <laughs> look in here. Um, and like he couldn't, he couldn't read or anything at first. And um, yeah, so, so at that particular time was about four months after the stroke, they actually put him in, the, in front of the mirror for the first time. And it was funny because Adi hadn't asked to look at himself or anything. I mean, he was very, very dopey, you know. Um, and, like, when we had visitors, it was, like, five minutes. That was all he could handle. That's all he could concentrate for. Um, but they put him in front of the mirror and and he saw himself for the first time. And, well, he couldn't really see much because of his eyesight, but what he could see he found quite confronting, uh, confronting you know. You could see the, 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 yeah. the sort of... Um, dip in his head, he, he couldn't sit up straight at that time, so it was all kind of, you know, over one side. And and um, he, he said to the uh, speech pathologist, I don't know why this question came to his mind, but he said, you know, will I ever drive again? And um, they said, probably not. So I get teary when I think about it because it just brings me back to the time. Um, and the reason I get teary is because of, you know, how 80 felt at the time and he just 
you know, and he's such a chirpy person, even through that horrific time, some of the things he had to endure were unbelievable, you know. I mean, I, I wouldn't even go into some of the stuff because it just sounds quite disgusting and awful. But, you know, some of the stuff that I saw happen to AD in the hospital was incredible. Um, but he just burst into tears when they said probably not. And then he just cried and cried like a, like a you know, howling. And um, I just hugged him and, and he said, I don't want to be a burden to Kate. You know, I, I, you know, I'm thinking about hurling myself down the stairs. And as I said, of course, he still had to find something funny about it. <laughs> And I just said, you know, 80, you know, we're going to get through this. I, I yeah. love you. I love you. I love you as you are, but, but we're going to get through it and you're, you're going to get better and we're going to be okay, you know. Um, so, yeah. And, and yeah, and, and it's funny because, like, the time before that I really heard 80 cry was when about, about two months after his stroke where they showed him, oh, his dad showed him the... Um, the cover yeah. of the newspaper and he, and he realized that he couldn't read and he just looked at it and, you know, he said, I just looks like hieroglyphics and he just cried because, you know, he loves reading and he was just like, wow, you know, just he was shocked because he didn't realize that, you know, so it's been a real process, hasn't it? But he's learned to read again now, but very, it's still very hard for 80 to read and it takes a long time. And it, it's like, I'm um, looking through like, the gushing fingers. Yeah, and they move. Yeah. So it's, he has to be careful he doesn't lose place. But things are getting better all the time, aren't they? Yes. Well, wow. um, it's, it's, um, I get goosebumps just listening to you and really just seeing how the support for one another. I mean, you must have felt that connection you were talking about, AD. You know, it's, we're, connect, we're all connected, but the connection that you and Kate have together was obviously so, so strong that help pull you through. Yes. Yeah, case of what doesn't kill us makes us strong. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. just a little bit of mustard and dystrophy then. <laughs> oh, you know, Jamie. I don't get it. So who came, did you, who came up with the idea for the book? Oh, well, it, that was kind of weird because, you know, a friend of ours who's quite, um, say, intuitive or... I guess you're saying very intuitive. She said to Adie, you know, you should write a book. I can see you write, you know. And 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 we just kind of pushed it aside. And a few other people said to Adie as well, you should write a book. And then when Adie came out of hospital, he really wanted to, he felt that what he'd learnt in hospital and the sort of epiphanies he'd had, that he could really help other people. Yeah. And so he actually rang the um, National Stroke Foundation and said, you know, I'd like to volunteer to, you know, if you'd like me to speak to any carers or stroke survivors and because I really feel that I've, what I've learnt, how to overcome the emotional side, you know, could help other people. It should be said, by the way, that, sorry, Kate, that um, interestingly, I had joined the, the volunteer board of Disability Media Australia just three days before my stroke. Yes, I saw that on your and, website. And, and I attended the first board meeting in my wheelchair. Wow. And then the CEO said that I was the most committed board member <laughs> for the cause of Disney Media Australia. Yeah. So, so basically what happened, the funny thing was that we didn't, that the Stroke Foundation never contacted AD about speaking, which was kind of weird, even though it left some messages. But um, what happened was AD started saying that he wanted to practice what he would say to help others. So because his speech was very... Um, he was very, very difficult to understand. Oh, back then, um, trying to hear me speak would be like listening to someone ho trying to hold a conversation with Labrador. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I used to record AD on the iPhone. Yes. And then I'd, you know, play it back to him. And anyway, it's really funny. One day he, he wasn't feeling that well, which was very unusual for him. And um, so he cancelled his physio session, which he, he never does. And I thought, wow, he really... But he said, oh, I just want to want to practice what I'm, you know, going to, to say. And, and it was just like everything just came out, like, orderly. You know, like the first thing I do is think of, you know, the things I'm grateful for and the other thing. And then I would, you know, ask myself, what's funny about this and what could I look back in a year's time and find funny about this? And, and then, you know, goal setting and you go through affirmations and it just, like, was all in order, like 10 points you know and it, 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 then i suppose the seeds of the thought came to me is that um 
what others believe and repeatedly say to you is one thing, but you, what you believe and repeatedly say to yourself is everything. Yeah. I love that. That's yeah. really awesome. Yeah. yeah. And that was one, yeah. So, so, so basically what happened was I then transcribed what AD said because I was like, wow, this is amazing. And we sent it off to um, Jack Canfield in America. Yeah. And he liked it and was happy to give a testimonial and, and that's kind of how it all started and, yeah. and um, you know, we decided to make it into a little book and sort of put it up on Amazon and, you know, um, our new book is not on Amazon, mind you, because um, our publisher doesn't deal with Amazon, but it is all, you know, in, in all the bookstores and everything. But the first version, just let you can see this. Yes. My Quill by Amazon Bestseller Award. <laughs> wow. And I'd like say, I'm going to enjoy this right down to the Chewy Chocolate Centre. <laughs> That's what Jim Carrey saying. Yeah. So, I mean, that's quite a coup getting someone like Jack Canfield to endorse your book. And, um, and I also um, see that um, Dr. John D Demartini has as well. Yes. Yeah, so we feel very blessed about that because there are two people that um, AD and I both really um, respect, respect a lot and that we've enjoyed their their work and, and seminars and that kind of thing. And um, But, yeah, it's, it's interesting because it, you, what – the core of the book was never meant to be a book. It was just 80 saying what he wanted to, to, to volunteer to help other people. So I, I really, you know, I think that authenticity really comes through. Absolutely. Um, and, yeah, I'm just so proud of 80. And, and then, of course, and then I thought, oh, good, maybe we can actually make some money, you know. And then, really? obviously, later on, 80 thought that too because, um, I mean, that's one thing that um, it doesn't always, you know, get get discussed what do you do when you go from you know uh from earning an income to all of a sudden not having an income you know or yeah. getting hundred dollars a week you know yeah. so um we we had our the social worker at the hospital say look at our finances and basically say we can put you down for social housing and all of that kind of thing and then you know we just said look that's not where we want to go you know that's and and I kind of think if there's a will, there's a way. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and we, and, and we just threw, to, we, we, we just believe that, and we're getting by, you know, and we're getting by and, and we, we see a bright future. And we've the the, 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 the lessons and values in the book into a new field of us entering the area of public speaking. Yeah. You know, we can be with their professional development days, that sort of thing. So, you know, we're, uh, We've begun some that, but we'll also recommence that at some point. You know, we trade under the uh, the brand of the Accidental Motivator. Accidental Motivator. I love that. I love that. Because it's hardly in plain and intentional, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so AD always says, you you know, tell God your plan. So it's a funny thing. Well, because... that's the, other joke. The, the joke I said is, one of my favorite jokes is, how do you make God laugh? Tell him your plans. <laughs> thing because we're both really into you know goal setting and manifestation and visualization and all of that kind of thing but on, on the other hand we kind of say well isn't it interesting that this happened you know that was definitely not something that we set to happen but maybe it was in a way because you know AD always said that he wanted to make a difference that he wanted to do it through you know media and communications so maybe we're just sort of going a bit of a different route you know <laughs> a detour. When they say with your goals to be specific otherwise you'll get something that wasn't in your plan that's it i think <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. but uh, if you came more, more fine-tuned be more uh, polished and accurate now exactly i'm sure you are i'm sure you are <laughs> and i you know life is a um i'm a big fan of the idea that that education comes in many forms and that we all learn by doing yeah life is 99 percent on the job training you know what I mean? Uh, no, carry on. What do you mean it's not? I said on life is 99% on the job training. Oh, it is. Yes, absolutely. Definitely. So it's, it's it all starts happening once you've left school as well. Yes, mm. yes. One of the things Aidy's really good at too is, um, you know, because we, as, as you know, we, we really respect Jack Canfield. We're actually just reading his Success Principles book again at the moment and, uh, and really applying the principles because it's so easy just to read, you know, books and just keep reading and not necessarily, you know, do exactly everything that they say. You always say you've got to work the principles if you want the principles to work. Yeah. <laughs> you've got the principles, the principles work for you. Yeah. Um, 
Oh, sorry, I've lost my train of thought. You, you were saying you've started to read Jack Canfield and you admire him and you're reading his book. Is there yeah, a... I can't, can't remember why I was saying it, sorry. Um, uh, oh, oh, I don't remember why I was saying it, but one, one interesting thing that we do do every day as well um, is we do read something positive every morning as well, you know, as well as a meditation and as well as 80s therapy. Um, because 80s learning to read again, uh, we decided, okay, if you're going to, you know, practice your reading let's yeah. make it something really uh good and so ad will read say you know maybe 10 minutes or so which m might be a page and a half it's not a lot because you know it's hard for him to read and then i'll take over and and read a little bit more and mm. um yeah that's been really good for us too hasn't it emotionally mentally yes, yes. so is there anybody else um that you admire in the field oh Oh and yeah, we love I? yeah. Rob Bob, Bob Proctor's great. Yep. Uh, I like um, listening to Michael Beckwith. Yes. Um, I'm just trying to trying to think of think of. Uh, I know I'm just looking at some of our books, like Stephen Covey. Well, he's not around anymore, but um, you know, we've read since eighty stroke. We've read. Uh, like Norman Doidge's The Brain That Changes Itself, all about neuroplasticity, um, which is really interesting just to, to, you know, just I find it fascinating how the brain can can change and how we can learn and and um, I can't just try. I'm not and, really thinking. And learning it. is a process that goes you from the cradle to the grave, you know. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Every, every, every single day. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, have you listened to what's that great, uh, great TV show that was uh, all about the brain? What was it called with Todd Sampson? Oh, I am the yeah, uh, redesign, Re redesign your brain. Have you ever listened to that? Oh, it's fantastic. It's basically just showing you know how we can learn, we can improve our creativity, we can improve our vision, we can improve, you know, uh, it's just amazing. Like they had, there's this one I, I talk about, about it in. With our book, we divide into sections. Like we have 80s voice and my voice, 80s voice and my voice. So you hear the, the, the stroke survivor, then you hear the, the caregiver. So we have that kind of all the way through the book. Um, but I, I really recommend watching that series because it really just shows you how amazing we are as human beings, you know, and what we can do and what we can achieve. I mean, T Todd Sampson went... Uh, from you know, being, he 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 did all these amazing things like he walked a tightrope, something he'd never been able to do. You know, he went to the best brain researchers around the world. He looked at some brain games where one brain game where within about six or seven hours you can actually improve your peripheral vision by about twenty years. So if you're a sixty year old, you can get the peripheral vision of a forty year old within about six or seven hours of just playing this game. So I mean, all these I people. Know that their peripheral vision is going in and in and in. And, I mean, it's just incredible. Like, it's so there's some amazing stories on that show um, from the the best brain scientists um, around the world. And, yeah, I just think that we're only only really starting to tap our potential. Mm -hmm. I mean, as human race, I mean, not me. <laughs> and to me, it, it says a lot about opening the mind, you know, using these techniques really do... Um, open the mind and expand us in a lot of ways and you you know you are just a walking amazing walking example of this just fantastic oh, thank what you what are your hopes for the future ad well obviously i'm i my focus is on a, you know complete and holistic recovery yeah. the focus on optimal health yeah and of the world, and you know, to quote me to the universe, world peace. <laughs> um, oh, I'd What's love to. Oh, sorry. My, I focus my purpose uh, as professionally, primarily to, to create, share and facilitate stories that move the heart as well as stretch and stir the soul. Awesome. And... Make to make a positive impact in the real world. Well, you've made an amazing impact on me today. <laughs> the Thank power you, is so you me? You <laughs> 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 said cheeky. What did you say? He said, "Are you hitting on me?" <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally cool if you are. He said, "He's totally cool if you are." <laughs>
I'm sure, you... Well, I'm hoping that Kate might have something to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just, I just, you know, sometimes I used to get worried that people would take AD seriously when he said things like that. And now I'm just like, ah, oh, whatever. Maybe the know. nurses knew that I just want to make them laugh. You know, they knew that I was in meaning by it. Oh, you're such a blessing. You really are an, an amazing inspiration. So, talking of which, you know, is there any, any parting advice that you can leave us with? today okay now if i was to speak to myself say 25 30 years ago maybe 20 years ago so i would say there are two life truisms i would like you to always remember one is that regardless of our situation it is how we choose to respond that says everything about us whether we like it or not and two if you want to change something in your life then change something in your life <laughs> Don't mess with it. That's it. Mm. It's sim the beauty of simplicity. Absolutely. And Kate, what about you? <sighs> oh, look, I think... Hmm. One of the things that I, I think is, is you just need to stay focused on what you want. You know, stay focused on your goals because I think it's so easy to you know, do a goal setting exercise every so often and write it down and think, oh yeah, this is what I want. And then you just put it away and um, then all of a sudden 20 years has gone by, you know. <laughs> Raise me much better off, as Jack would say, bombarding your subconsciousness with it, you know. Yeah. So it becomes inherently ingrained in your psyche and your being. It's yeah. a being. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm writing my book. Um, it's called Life's a Load of Balls. And my balls are, it's all about those conditions that are a load of bollocks. But it's also using the quantum physics and we are balls of energy. And it's about keeping us all energized and, you know, bombarding ourselves, you know, bombarding ourselves with all the energy that we want and, and sustaining it. It's, it's, oh, that sounds fantastic. I like the name too. <laughs> yeah, well, that's kind of me ballsy. And that's, I can really pick up the sense of humour here. So, um, and then and mine's, I'm inspired to finish my book by the end of this year because I've been giving birth to it for about eight years and I think people have lost faith in the fact that I'm actually going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good on you. This sounds great. Well, Bob, uh, um once you add me onto Facebook, LinkedIn, please um, pick up and read the book. And I'd really like to hear your thoughts on what, what, hey, what you think merits are. Um, oh, absolutely. I can, and I really, really can't wait. And um, I, next time I'm over in Aussie, that you're in Melbourne, yes? You do. Yeah, we're in Melbourne. Yes, okay. I'll, I'll look you up and you can um, you can take me on a hot date, hey, AD, and then... <laughs> you know, yeah, we'll both take it on a date. We'll take it on a dinner. It'll be lovely. It'll be and, and Philippa, if, if any of your listeners um, want to contact us, they can contact us through our website, which is www.littlebookofhope.com. That you know, they're most welcome to you know send us an email or got a question or or something like that. Um, you know, so we're really you know I know that a lot of people feel quite lost if they're particularly. Um, I mean, one in six people apparently in Australia have a stroke. So and then there's a lot more than that that have brain injuries, and a lot more than that that are carers or or are affected in in some way. So yeah, so if we can um, you know help in some way. Fantastic. Fantastic. The website again, www.littlebookofhope.com. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll put all your credentials out for the world to see. Sensational, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you so much for your time today because I know it's um, it's um, quite exhausting um, talking for quite so long. So, uh, That's all right. But you've made a huge difference in my life already. Bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our work here is done. Bye-bye. Take care. Cheers, you too.